Hey everybody, um, welcome to Ditch Your Textbooks with Google Apps. And I'm very excited to be a part of this session today. My name is Casey Bell um, from shakeuplearning.com. I am also a digital learning consultant in the Dallas, Texas area. If I happen to look off suddenly, um, we're under a tornado watch, so just warning everybody if I disappear. Um, I am a Google education trainer and a Google certified teacher, and I'm very excited to be here today and to introduce you to our other panelists today. We have James Peterson in Canada, and he is a former high school math teacher and a consultant with Amplified IT, also a Google education trainer and Google certified teacher. He also creates some amazing scripts that he shares with the community. And we also have Dean Dahl, a sixth grade teacher in Minnesota, a Google educator, and yes, another Google certified teacher. We have a bit of a reunion going on today. So, um, and our, our fearless leader today, we have the Matt Miller joining us in Indiana, Spanish teacher, blogger at ditchthattextbook.com, a Google certified teacher, speaker, presenter, PBS Digital Innovator, and a BAMI Awards nominee. So I'm very excited to have Matt um, lead this off and also very excited to announce that he just published his first book, Ditch That Textbook, Free Your Teaching. So um, without further, further ado, I will pass it on to Matt. All right. Thank you very much, Casey. Well, I'm very excited to be here, too. And I want us to start off by thinking about the world that a lot of our students live in, whether our students are young or, you know, all the way up to middle school, high school, and beyond. Um, they sort of live in two worlds. One is this world of academia that seems to be full of textbooks and pencils and papers and desks all in rows and everything. And then if you think of the the other world that they live in when they're outside of that, we could call that their digital world. And that's the one that they're really craving to get back to, the one that they're really craving to get into that's full of social media and sharing and instant communication and learning on the spot. Whatever it is that they need, they're able to learn it. And silently, I think they're begging us to merge the two. So how can we do that? And before we get into that, I think we have some really good stuff for you today on that. One question you might be asking is, why in the first place should we do that? And I can think of three really good, good reasons. One is that learning is available at any time. Whenever we, we have our learning in this digital world, that students don't have to be right in the classroom with the paper that you just handed them working on activities. They can really be anywhere to do this as long as they've got an internet connection, sometimes they don't even need that. Another reason is that it's collaborative. Students can work together basically when they're next to each other or in another room or in another building, and they're able to put things together on their own that are better than what they could do by themselves. And then it also gives us a global reach because if you have that collaborative opportunity, it doesn't just stop with people nearby and that it's just as easy to share and work with people from around the globe as it is from somebody in the next room. And so the amazing thing about all of this is that we can provide all of it at little to no, at little to no cost in addition to the devices that so many of our, our schools have or the devices that our students carry in our pockets. And so in our 45 minutes together, I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about creating a home for your, all of your stuff online. I want to talk about creating, collaborating, and sharing with your students. And I want to talk about connecting our classrooms to the world. And those are really three of the big things that have driven my own personal digital learning space that, that I, I use with my students. And so I want us to start thinking, first of all, about creating a home for our stuff. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about, about where I started with, with all of this. And it started about six years ago. I'm a high school Spanish teacher. And so about six years ago, I hate to say it, but in a lot of ways, I was a really crummy teacher. I did a lot of teaching from directly from the textbooks. We would read a chapter. We would have discussion questions at the end. We would have comprehension questions at the end. We would write those down on a little sheet of paper and turn those in. Did a lot of worksheets, did a lot of workbook pages. 
And I mean, I could just see in my students' eyes the lack of engagement. And the thing that started to dawn on me after a few years of teaching this way was that I had all these students who were taking Spanish classes, but they weren't able to speak Spanish. And that's a real problem if you are a Spanish teacher, because that's how students are going to use that skill out in the real world. And so I knew something had to change, but sort of felt kind of powerless and hopeless on how I was going to change it. And so I start, at, at one point, I think we were having a, a I think I had just lectured them for about 40 minutes on something exciting like reflexive verbs or the imperfect tense in Spanish. And after I got done, I gave them an assignment to do that night and gave them a little bit of time to work in class. And I had a lot of this. Or maybe a lot of this. Or talking, or basically they weren't, they weren't doing what I needed them to do. And so I got upset. And what I did here, actually, I want to show you kind of what my experience looked like. We're going to call this my path to textbook liberation. This is a little sketch that I did on my uh, iPad. And so we're up here kind of at the beginning where it's, uh, the students are kind of snoozing and there's blah, blah, blah about boring grammar. And I got frustrated and I said, that's it. We're doing extra homework tonight. I was going to punish them for what they were doing, that they weren't doing exactly what I needed them to do, and so they were going to get punished. And so they were less than thrilled about that. The bell rang, and there they go. If you look on my little sketch here, there they go running straight for the door. And at that moment, I knew something had to change. And so the next day, those students came back in, and one of the first things that I said was, your textbooks are going in here. I had these really tall, eight-foot wooden cabinets. And so my students all went over just kind of carrying their books and they're looking at me out of the corner of their eye like, am I in trouble? Did we do this? Is this, was this us? And so after that, I started delivering their content to them instead of in textbook form in these, these study guides that they were required to, it was what they were responsible for for the week. And we started engaging more in conversation in class. We started finding tools online that allowed us to really get into the content and create some cool stuff. And things were good at first, but one of the real struggles that I had was that we had all of these things that we were creating. We had these study guides. We had these activities that the students were doing. And it just all kind of got jumbled together. And I didn't have a good way to keep to keep things sorted out. And so I decided at that point that I needed a home for my stuff, for the stuff that my students were going to create. And so basically what I did there was, and I want to show it to you real quick, I created a class website. This can easily be done on Google Sites. Um, I didn't really know about Google Sites when I first created it, so this one's created using Weebly, which is another website creator. And so this is my class website, and it has tabs for all of my different classes up here. Um, it has some, um, this is a video that one of my classes produced. This is my classroom management plan. I never had my students read their classroom management plan, so I thought if I sketched it, maybe they would read it. And it really boiled things down, and so that helped. And so I want to show you one of my class, one of the pages for my class. Um, this is a link to a Google document, and so if I clicked on this, it would show what they were required to do for, required to learn for that one particular week. I link to quizzes on Google Forms this way. If I have instructions for a sub, then I can leave those here. We have Quizlet flashcards. I mean, there, there are all sorts of things that I put on these, uh, on these class websites. In fact, if we go down a little farther, here are sketches that we did on the, on the, whiteboard to illustrate a story that we came up with in class. If we go down a little farther, this is an activity that we did where we wrote, we created these little, they're kind of like mini posters, I guess, uh, using Google Drawings and some Creative Commons photos. And so we were able to put, put all those things up there. So it basically just becomes a place where all of your students can interact with this uh, content that they're creating. And as I created this website, I started to realize something. I thought that I was teaching without textbooks, but I really wasn't. Because this website became my digital textbook. 
because you see your print textbooks, once they come off the press, they're set. They're almost set in stone and there's no way to change them. But as long as I have my class website, I'm able to go in and make little changes and then publish it and immediately my students are able to see it. And if I see that my class is starting to veer off in a direction that my curriculum isn't set toward, I'm able to change my class website and it updates as we make progress through my curriculum. And so it's been, it's been a really great home for everything that we do in our class. So with that in mind, talking about creating a home, home for your stuff, I do have these, these great Google certified teachers and great educators in the session with me. And so I wanted to throw it out to Casey and James and Dean and see, do you have anything else that kind of goes along with this? Any, any other advice to teachers? Um, that kind of thing. So if you've got something, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and let us know. I used to put a Twitter widget into my classroom website because I could get a classroom update done right from my phone from my pocket. So all I would do is tweet out a link to something that we talked about today and it would show up in my class website. And I'd always get the kids saying, oh, you're not allowed to use your phone in the classroom. And I'd laugh and I'd just tell them that I'm tweeting their homework. That's great. Um, I, I love it. Go ahead, Dean. Sorry. I'm going to follow uh, you and uh, you're spot on, Matt, with what I've experienced in the classroom because I jumped all in two summers ago and I'm just screen sharing my uh, website. And, and this is purely one way that I, I mean, it's a one way communication that I've been using. Um, but I've taken everything and, um, for instance, the chapters, all the notes, all the lecture notes, they're out there early on. And it's surprising how uh, initially some teachers say, well, what if they look ahead? And I think, oh, boy, that'd be a horrible problem to have students uh, <laughs> planning ahead for what's a, uh, what lies ahead. But the bigger piece that I found is that they can go back and look up resources as because the, our physics curriculum certainly all connects. And they say something like, wow, that connected back to chapter three. And they look at my notes in chapter three and maybe the concept notes and they look at it and they can see that, yeah, it is, it is back here. And I found it in, uh, you know, positions and velocity. So it's been a great way for students to, uh, to have access at their fingertips and where a textbook, yes, they have all the same uh, options in a textbook, but they're less apt to go and look back at what they had previously studied, if that makes sense. Very good. I like that, Dean. Um, Casey, you had some some tips that would help uh, teachers incorporate these kind of things into classrooms. Could you could you share those with us? Yes, and I'm looking for the screen to share. Let's see. If you can't find it, I can stick your poster. Too many screens open. Sorry about that. So um, I have some just some general tech integration tips that I share a lot with teachers. And um, I'm not sure why that one isn't popping up. There we go. So these are uh, my top ten picks here. Can, it, can you see it, Matt? Yes, there uh, they are. So um, I have this poster on my blog, too, if anyone would like to go download it. But um, I'm just going to go through these really quickly. These are the things that I say all the time when I'm trying to help teachers who really are, are just starting out with technology integration. So even with the things like Matt is talking about and just getting a home for your stuff and setting up a classroom website, you know, it's easy to get overwhelmed. And so one of the first things that I always talk about is when you're planning to always start with your objectives, your learning goals, your learning objectives, and not the tool. It's really easy to get excited about the tool, and I'm sure many people are getting really excited about Google Apps today, but you always want to make sure that you're starting with the learning in mind. Um, the next thing is to always be consistent, because if you're constantly trying something different every day, your kids are going to get lost. Um, they need consistency, they need a little bit of structure, and you know, the more consistent you are, then you can start dabbling and getting a little more creative. 
Um, another thing that I'm very guilty of is to don't don't let yourself get swept away by new tools. I am an early adopter. I'm one of the first ones to sign up for something cool when I hear about it. But in the classroom, you really need to be careful and, and, and check things out beforehand and not to just jump on the bandwagon just because you saw something came out, you know, the day before. And this one's really big. Don't be afraid to let your students teach you. Your kids are a wealth of knowledge, and especially when it comes to technology. So I highly recommend that you, you let your students teach you how to do things. And anytime that you're stuck, you know, ask a student, hey, do you know how to do this? And I guarantee you there's a kid in the class who will be more than happy to help you out. And along with that is to utilize those student tech experts in the classroom to help other kids. And that frees you up to do other things like small group instruction and to facilitate the learning while kids can help each other answer those how-to questions. And, you know, um, they're going to learn better from each other anyway, so sometimes we just have to get out of the way. Um, start small. I and mean, don't try to integrate too many digital tools at once. You know, if you're, if you're new to integrating technology, you don't want to get caught up in app smashing and, and try to do too much. So, um, you know, take small, small bites, do what you can, and, and move on from there. Another strategy that I love to use is the Ask 3 Before Me, and I will use this with adults <laughs> as well, um, just to encourage them to, to ask each other and to find those answers on their own so that they can become more independent learners and to collaborate with each other. And we always want to find new ways to give students voice and choice. So if you can build that into what you're planning for your students, it's going to become that much more powerful if we can give students ownership of their learning. And this one is huge. I'm always telling people that it's, I feel like it's my job to make you uncomfortable. I want you to take risks. I want you to get out of your comfort zone. That magical place where all of these fantastic things happen are not going to be in your comfort zone. So um, you really have to push yourself to get outside of that. And uh, last but not least, always have a plan B and probably a C, D, and E as well. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to have a second lesson plan planned for everything, but we're teachers. We're flexible, um, and you've got to be flexible when it comes to technology. If you throw your hands up in the air every time something doesn't work, then, then you're never going to get anywhere because things like that happen to all of us every single day. So just be prepared um, for what your backup plan is. And I will hand it back over to Matt. That was awesome. Casey, you could just keep preaching that stuff the rest of this time. I would have That would have been great. So um, now if someone wants to get a copy of that poster, what's the, the best way for them to do that? I know you said it's on their website, on your website. And I think she's muted herself. Oops, sorry, I was in a hurry. Um, I'll, I'll throw it into the q and I didn't know if you had it in the, the resources that you were putting together, but um, I can definitely give that. You can search top tech tips on shakeuplearning.com and find it very easily, but I'll throw it into the Q&A as well. Okay, that's great. And that probably is the, the easiest way, I bet, is to go to shakeuplearning.com and just search for top tech tips. So, Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Casey. We have a question we're going to answer real quick. It says, hello from Bronx, New York. Great idea. I also love Weebly and Quizlet. My only question is, do you think that higher ed will catch on to no textbooks? Do you worry that students won't know how to access or read textbooks when they get to college? Any thoughts? That's a good question. I actually had a colleague at my school once tell me that he didn't think ditching textbooks was a good idea because students were going to need them so much in college. And, you know, my, my own personal thought is that my students are pretty sharp, and if they are able to find answers to whatever they need through looking them up online or finding resources at their disposal, I don't think they're going to have that hard of a time of finding them in textbooks if they need to. Um, that's just my own personal personal thought there. And as far as higher ed catching on, you know, it seems to me like higher ed is awfully slow to adapt to change. But I know of some there are some really really good college professors out there, and you know, really good people in leadership of colleges and and universities. And so um, my hope is that it that will it will catch on eventually. I think it's going to become th this kind of learning will become so prevalent at the as time moves on that I don't think they have any choice but to catch on. So, 
anyway, that's just that's just my own my own thought on that one. So, all right. So let's move on to the second part of our presentation today. That is create, collaborate, and share with your students. And so Google Apps is so great for this kind of thing, in my opinion, because it makes things that we've done before a lot easier sometimes, and then it allows us to do things that, that we were never able to do before. And an example of that, one, one little activity, I want to give you just a couple of little ideas of how you can use um, some of the basic Google apps in your classroom. These are things that you can start using on Monday if you want to, and they're really easy to set up. And so one thing that I've done is I've set up a presentation, and I'm going to see if I can switch over and access that. And James and Dean and Casey are all in that presentation, or at least I hope they are. Yep, looks like they are right now. So I'm going to let you take a look at that. And so basically what I've done here is I've created a presentation. And um, for, for the three of you that are in here, if you'll go ahead and, and start entering some content into this so people can see, I've created this presentation and then I just, I personally set it as with the share button here, I, I made it anyone with the link can edit and then I shared this link with them. And so they were able to come in here and <laughs> I mentioned something about meerkats as we were getting ready for this and somebody put put it in there. But um, so now basically each of them has taken a slide. So they all clicked on that link and they all came in and since they all have the permission to edit, now they're all able to add information in. And so Casey put her name and put Shake Up Learning somebody put something about meerkats and then linked to the Wikipedia entry on meerkats that's like extra credit right there so that's great oh and Dean took a screenshot and stuck it on there I am most impressed you guys all get gold stars very good and so what's great about this is that you can do this with your students and if I have a class of 20 students there will be 20 slides over here I usually assign them a slide by just going one two three four five six seven up and down the the columns there's the gold star. Oh, you guys are too much. And so each of them goes into their own slide and then they're able to type information. And what's neat is that you can, in a matter of five or ten minutes, you can crowdsource your class to gather information on things. And so if I'm getting ready to do a cultural presentation about the, the different autonomous regions of Spain, which are kind of like the United States as states, what we can do is I'll assign one to each of the students and then they will pull a little bit of information and maybe a picture and they will stick it onto their um, they'll stick it onto their slide and then what we can do is at the end once they're done in maybe 10 minutes or so we can flip through and we have this custom produced slideshow shakeuplearning.com next session at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time see you there there's your little commercial Casey <laughs> so this is really one of my absolute favorite things to favorite things to do with this. And now what you can also do with these, once this presentation is shared, this kind of thing can be turned into an instant blog. So if you don't want to set up blogs for your students, if you just don't want to take the time, what we can do is you can give each student a slide and give them a writing prompt. And so they're able to write, you know, maybe they could give a put the title up here add their name here and then they come down here to the text. You can obviously make it smaller if you have more text and this is my writing prompt. I'm writing my thoughts about it. I know that's not very deep <laughs> but it's a little bit of text anyway. And then what we can do is, so let's see if my um, if my colleagues here can come in and, and add some comments. You can start a comment conversation which is basically the heart of what a blog is because blogs are kind of like online journals where people can comment. And so you start the conversation and then other people are able to add comments like we had over here. Dean says this is a neat slide. James says can't wait. Casey says thanks. And so we're able to kind of talk to each other and then actually have, if it doesn't, nope, that's just in a straight line. Okay, so you can see how the conversations can all happen over here too. So that's just another neat thing that you can do that's quick and easy that you could start using as soon as Monday in your classes. And now another one that I want to show you real quick, it's the same sort of idea. So if I can get Dean and James and 
Casey over into the shared drawing. Basically, I took a Google Drawing. If you're not familiar with Google Drawings, this is one of my absolute favorite tools in Google Apps. And it basically gives you this blank canvas, and you can add text and shapes and images and different things to it. And so what this becomes is an interactive whiteboard that everybody has control of. And so you can put Casey as a pirate in it if you wanted to. Apparently she did. That's pretty impressive, Casey. And so if you, if you have all of your students jump into this and you say, okay, and you call one student out and you say, I want you to add something to it. And so then they add a cloud. And then somebody else could add, oh, oh Casey disappeared, but they could add a lightning bolt out of the cloud. Um, think, you can probably think of different ways this could be customized to your particular situation. But it's just another neat way, this, in this case, a little more visual way to, to bring everybody onto the same page. And there would have to be some classroom management <laughs> techniques to use here because obviously, as you can see right here with my three people and me not giving them any rules about anything, that it's just kind of like it could become chaos very fast. But this is, this is a fun kind of chaos. But if you had 20 or more students all in one, you'd have to be very clear to say, you know, we need to do this. We need to have only one person working in the document at once. So if everybody will watch, and then if I call on you, you can add yours so that it doesn't become, like I said, total chaos. Unless you're looking for total chaos. Yeah, yikes, tornado. I have a thunderstorm outside of my window too, but it seems to be lightening up a little bit, so... Okay, so that's something else that you can do with Google Apps that you can start using as soon as tomorrow. Actually, tomorrow is Sunday. It'd probably be Monday. <laughs> so anyway, I want to again throw it out to my colleagues here and see if they have any little quick ideas for how you can create, collaborate, and share with your students using Google Apps. So if, if you've got any, any, any ideas, go ahead and unmute and take it away. Okay, I'll, ju I'll jump in here, and uh, we are actually doing this right now, and hopefully my screen shares okay. Uh, we will be, uh, I've had students use drawing and uh, have them drawing atoms, and we're at the very basic level of understanding the energy levels and how it fits on the periodic table. Uh, but we're going to take it the next level for those students that uh, are at that point to dig a little deeper. So we're going to create one atom, and a, a very basic, and then uh, like nitrogen here, and then have the next student collaborate and add a couple energy levels or add, um, add to the nucleus and quiz each other and share with each other what is, what did I just create? Which, uh, which element did I create? And is it accurate? Does it have the right energy levels? Does it have the right protons, electrons, neutrons? And the kids are motivated to do it because they love using drawing, and they do a far better job creating on drawing than sometimes they do when they work on uh, pencil and paper. So this is really slick, and uh, it motivates learning for sure. That's great. That's I, I love that that very specific particular use of it. That's that's good. So, okay, very good. Um, if it's okay with the other two, I think we're going to jump on into this last section just to make sure that we can get through everything. And so this last section that we have is called Connect with the World. This is one of my favorite things that Google Apps is able to do is that by doing basically what Casey, James, Dean, and I did with the shared presentation, the shared drawing, you can basically share all of your work that you do on Google Apps with anyone throughout the world that has an internet connection. And all they have to do is just join with that link, or if you share it with them uh, by email, they're able to get into it. And so I have a couple of uh, cool instances that, that I know of where I know really, and, and this is a great example of how you can use these tools and this technology to do things that were previously inconceivable. One of my favorite stories 
comes from a, another school in Indiana where, where I am right now. Um, this is a school in northern Indiana, and a student of theirs that I think was in the sixth grade just sent a letter to Shaquille O'Neal, the, the basketball player in the NBA. I think this was back when he was still playing. It might have been after he retired. And just asked for a couple of signed things, wanted to tell him that he was a big fan. And he expected maybe he might get something back from Shaq, but what he got was much more impressive. He got a Skype session. I think they use Skype. You could definitely use Google Hangouts. But he got a Skype session with Shaq to his entire school. And so there's a screenshot of the video. Now, if you're in the... If you happen to go to the session resources page, which is at ditchthattextbook.com slash D-T-T-G-A-F-E. That's like Ditch That Textbook, Google Apps for Education. And I can, I can make mention of that again here in a little bit. Um, but if you go to that, it has a link to the video if you want to watch it. And it's so cool because... Basically, Shaq takes this opportunity to answer kids' questions and he tells them why they need to stay in school, why it's important to learn how to read, why math was important to him as, a, as an NBA player. And so there are just such cool things that you can do with, you know, in that case you could do with Google Hangouts because this video chat service is really available to about anybody in the world. And so, again, at that, at that same site, ditchthattextbook.com slash D-T-T-G-A-F-E. I have links to a handful of different Google Plus communities where you can connect with other teachers. I know there's one in particular called Educators on Google Plus that has tens of thousands of people in it. And so if you're looking to connect with a teacher somewhere, that is a great place to start. So that's that's one way that one thing that you can use to connect with connect with other classrooms and connect with connect your students with other people. And I want to tell you about another one. This one, this one is one that happened in my own particular class. My, um, my Spanish 3 class, because I have, I have all levels of high school Spanish in my classes, and my Spanish 3 class got connected with a class from Valencia, Spain. And this was the neatest thing. They basically, once a week, and it was on Mondays, my students would come to my class, and they would get paired up, and each pair would have an iPad and they would do a video chat with a pair of students in Spain once a week for a couple of months and they would start with some some basic discussion questions they would talk for 15 minutes in English they would talk for 15 minutes in Spanish and then in the last 15 minutes they would just get an opportunity to just talk with each other in whatever language they wanted to use in whatever way they wanted to use and so this is what it looked like at the beginning the very very beginning we had a full group session and we did a, a mystery location call activity which is basically where each class goes back and forth and asks each other yes or no questions about where they are in the world geographically until one of them guesses it. It's kind of a combination of 20 questions and battleship if you want to look at it that way. And so they did that first and then after that they started they started talking one-on-one -on -one. actually it was two-on-two -two. And that was a really good thing, actually, for two students with two students because nobody felt isolated and they always had somebody to lean back on. And I have to tell you, that is really one of the most game-changing activities that my students did ever since I started teaching. And there were technical glitches and it wasn't smooth and it wasn't easy, but it was still so worth it. And the reason is I have students who are in the middle of a small community, very agricultural, very rural. A lot of them don't get outside of the state, let alone outside of the country. And in a place where there are such horrible stereotypes about people who speak Spanish, there's a lot of people that will say, oh, these, you know, these people who are speaking Spanish, they're just here to steal our jobs. And there, there are really negative stereotypes, and I have fought and fought and fought since I started teaching to try to get rid of those stereotypes and there was nothing that I could do that was more impactful on my students than to get them connected with real live Spanish speaking students from another country because they finally started to see how alike they were how they liked the same things, how they were interested in, in clothing and making each other laugh and and having having good friendships and hanging out with their friends and just the the silly things that they did in those last 15 minutes it made that connection 
And so for some of them that will never leave the country, they've had a real live international experience because of what they did right there. And so there are great ways for you to get connected with other teachers and other places. I know the Google Cultural Institute is a really cool thing where if you want to do some virtual field trips, this, is, this one generally isn't so much outside of the United States, but the Google Cultural Institute is a great place for that too. And so those are, those are some of my, my favorite examples of how that can work as far as video chatting goes. And then if you bring in Google Documents into that, or Google Slides. We took a, a Google document and we shared it with these students in Spain. And my students would ask them questions by typing them into the document. And then by the next day, the students in Spain will have, would have answered the questions. And every once in a while, if we were lucky, the students in Spain were in the document working on the answers at the same time that we were in it finishing up the questions. It was just a really neat experience. I know there's there's it's sort of like there's not anything huge about us doing that, but there kind of is because it really made you feel like you were in the same digital space with them. And it was it's just one of my favorite examples of how of how these things can can work. And so as far as connecting your classrooms to the world, I want to throw this one out to Casey, James, and Dean and see if they have any interesting examples of their own. And don't be shy. And if you don't, that's okay. I don't see anybody jumping at this one, so that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say something real quick. Um, th this is more in terms of teachers have become my students. And um, with the Google Educator groups that we now have through Google+, Plus, um, we are working, the North Texas group works with the Central Texas group, and we are putting on um, Google Hangouts as innovation challenges for teachers. So they come and they learn a 30 minute, um, you know, how to integrate in the classroom. And then they come back and they post in the community what they've actually um, integrated and share that with the community. But having um, not only the way to connect your own classrooms, but the, the connections that we now have in professional development, which is sort of my, my world these days, um, I think that's amazing because I've been able to connect and to learn with you guys and we're all across the country here so um, there's power in it for students and for, um, for adults as well. Absolutely, very good. Okay, so I want to, I want to first of all thanks, thank James. James has been my comment moderator and so he's been throwing some, some uh, questions my way and it looks like we've had some, some really good questions come up in the Q&A and so I wanted to address some of those really quick and then once I'm done, um, Dean and James and Casey, if you have anything else to, to throw in, that would be a good time to do that. And So the first question comes from Hannah Hurley and she says, do you feel like this saves you more time not using textbooks or do you think that the innovation is worth more time than using textbooks? See, for me, at the beginning it wasn't necessarily saving me time, but I've found now that I have some resources kind of built up, then it really does save me time because I don't have to go and create anything from scratch. I do, I actually do tweak things, change things from time to time, um, but I don't have to go kind of reinvent the wheel every single time. And I, I like the second part of that. Do you think that innovation is worth more time than using textbooks? You know, I think there's the saving time aspect of it, but there's the idea of sort of changing education, changing the way that we do education, and breaking out of this mold that we have to teach from chapter one until chapter 40. Um, and even for, for teachers that kind of skip around, sometimes they'll see things and they'll go, gosh, that is just not relevant to my students. And so I think it absolutely is worth the, worth the time to innovate. So that's a great question. Another one, do you ever have students produce research for your textbook site? I love this question. Do they produce study guides? What tools do you use for this? Okay, I'm going to do this kind of backwards. What tools do I use for it? For me personally, to create these study guides where I present information to my students, I just do a simple Google document. Just keep it really simple. Used to be Word documents and I printed those out. That was before I had devices available to all of my students. And now I have a cart of Chromebooks and so that, that's been huge. Do the students produce the study guides? I wish I had thought of that earlier. And, and sort of they do. Um, 
What's great is we have vocabulary lists. And we have all of the required vocabulary in one part of the document. And then down below it, I will pull the document up on the projector screen and I'll say, OK, these aren't going to be on the test. But what vocabulary words are you interested in learning? What did I forget? What did I leave off? And it's amazing to see, A, how many words they add to the list themselves. They're giving themselves extra words to learn. And B, how many of those words they actually end up learning in the end, even though they weren't going to be on the test. And so I think that's, that's a great example of how we have the prescribed curriculum, but then we also have this extra curriculum where if we give the students an opportunity to learn what they want to learn, that they end up learning a lot more than they, they would otherwise. And do I ever have students produce research for it? Not specifically for the study guides, but my students are creating things for me and I'm sticking them on the website too, kind of displaying their, their work. And so that's, you know, that's, that's one way that I do that. How do, I, how do we find the community that you mentioned, educators on Google Plus? Thank you, Deb, for asking that question. If you go to, this is the, the link again, and forgive me for not putting this on any of my slides or anything, and if um, one of my moderators could go in and add this to the Q&A or something, that would be good. Um, it's just ditchthattextbook.com slash DTT. G-A-F-E, that's D-T-T, -T, like Ditch That Textbook, G-A-F-E, like Google Apps for Education. So ditchthattextbook.com slash D-T-T, G-A-F-E. That's the place to find that. And the last question, this is a good one too, do you think this idea of ditching textbooks meets common core standards? That's a question by Claudia Rose. Claudia, that's a great question. Um, I think it does. I mean, what, whether you're using a textbook or whether you're not using a textbook, your common core state standards still stay the same. They're still learning goals. And we're able to meet those learning goals despite whether we're using this textbook or that textbook or no textbooks. And so in the end, I think we still get to it. I know there's one particular part that I think this does a fabulous job of. And I know common core state standards talk about something to the effect of producing for an authentic audience. And I think whenever we're able to put student work onto our class website, when students are able to blog, especially if they're able to blog publicly, that that's creating this sort of public venue for their work where we can direct people over to that blog address or we can direct people to that website who are able to check it out and leave comments and then we get their viewpoints and their experiences where we never would get that otherwise. And so I know specifically for that part, that's one area where it really does meet common core state standards. But I think it goes along with what do you want to do in your classroom? How are you going to use it? So those, those are great questions. So um, I want to throw it real quick over to Casey, James, and Dean. And if you don't have, um, just to see if you have any, anything to add to any of those questions. And if not, I have something specific to follow up with. Give me a thumbs up if you're good. Thumb, thumb, thumb. Okay. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about do you think that colleges will catch up to this whole no textbooks phenomenon? And Dean, you wrote a little comment into our, our group chat here. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your, your son's college for just a second. Yes, uh, my son just graduated uh, actually yesterday, and uh, so that's a highlight in our family. And uh, the college he goes to, Winona State, and they are a one to one device college that when you come in you get to have a either a PC or a Mac and uh, he went through the uh, the health uh, he's athletic training so uh, all of the uh, all the uh, text and the items the presentations they would do collaboration just as you're talking Matt and he said uh, we just talked about this last night uh, how much of it of the text was online and the material and he said at least 80 percent and I think uh, and, and Winona has been doing this one-to-one -one for oh goodness six seven years so they've been very progressive so it seems like at least that institution is moving forward and finding a balance between the two very good I'm so glad to hear that that's because my, my college experience wasn't exactly like that so so that's good Okay, so to kind of bring this all full circle, we were talking a little bit earlier about my path to textbook liberation. And so here, we're, here we are down at the bottom. I'm going, what in the world was I thinking? 
and now we've moved up to this area here where now I have students that can say things like, yo puedo hablar español mucho mejor que antes. I can speak Spanish much better than before, and then there's me going, yes. And so that's, it wasn't, it wasn't easy to get to, to this, and I'm not even saying that everybody has to go textbook free all the time, but if you did it every once in a while, if you kind of broke away from that textbook and created things specifically for your students, which I know so many teachers do and do such a great job of, then I think that's really going to help out. So um, I want to give you some contact information for everybody that was moderating. I want to thank everybody out there, Casey and Dean and James. Um, kind of going down the list, this is where you can reach me. I do present on technology-related things, so if you're interested in more information about that, ditchthattextbook.com slash conferences, or you can connect with me at any one of these places. Um, as I believe most of our uh, moderators do the same, so you could, you could certainly contact them if you were interested in that. Um, there's Casey's contact information as well as Dean's and James's, and so I'm going to leave that up here as we finish up. And I want to thank you so much for coming to this session. I hope it's been useful, and I hope that you get an awful lot out of the rest of the Education on Air conference. So thanks again for coming. Thanks for having us, Matt. That was fantastic. Yeah, that was just very cool. Very cool. Great job.